Welcome back everybody to another reaction video and I've had a number of requests for me to react to the fallen of World War II. Uh, I've seen this suggested to me uh, in my recommended videos on YouTube but I have not watched it before so I'm interested to see what it is that you guys uh, see in this that you want me to react to so much. So we're just going to dive right into it and I'll kind of react as I go along. Please don't forget to hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you check out all my other videos. Thanks for watching. Here we go. The average lifespan of an American is 80 years. And an 80 year old today was 10 when World War II ended. Four when it began. A soldier who saw battle would have to be in his late 80s, at least today. Generals, political leaders, the decision makers of the war, few are still with us. And over the past few decades, we've seen authors and filmmakers rush to capture stories from survivors. So, you know, it's interesting, and one of the things that, that is fascinating about the war is that uh, at the start of 1945, three uh, of the leaders of various nations were no longer in control of those nations by the end of 1945. Franklin Roosevelt died in April. Uh, of course, Adolf Hitler died a few weeks later when he took his own life. Uh, and then uh, Winston Churchill was actually voted out of office in July of 1945. Uh, so the UK, the US, and Germany, all led by different people by the end of the war. Um, well, of course, so was Japan, but that was because they lost. Uh, Joseph Stalin dies, what, eight years later in 1953. Um, but it's kind of interesting to think about how many of uh, those leaders, particularly two of the three main allied leaders, uh, didn't uh, stay in power to the end of the war. Before this connection of memory is lost. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're going to tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives are cut short by the war, and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. We'll be counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. <laughs> Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men. The average age was about 23. In most battles, for every 1,000 soldiers killed, there are more than 1,000 who were injured. The word casualty can be confusing because in military speak, it often includes both deaths and injuries and anything else that takes a soldier out of service. Here, we're just counting the deaths, and we'll begin with American soldiers. Now, uh, you know, for the United States, outside of our American Civil War, which took upwards of 750,000 lives, uh, but the vast majority of those were actually from illness. Uh, and so for the United States, World War II was uh, the war in which we saw the most combat deaths of any war that we've been involved in. Uh, and yet, I know our numbers pale in comparison to the vast majority. Uh, I think something like 400,000 uh, Americans died during World War II. Stack that up against the millions suffered by the Soviet Union, Japan, China, uh, Germany, a uh, number of countries who just were devastated by the numbers. Over 400,000 died. Most of the deaths occurred in the European theater, fighting the Nazis. And about a quarter were in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese. So the, the US actually had decided early on that the focus was gonna be to defeat Germany first mm -hmm. because it was gonna take time to take out the Japanese in the Pacific. And it kind of worked out that way. Um, and, of course, you can see that with the, the number of casualties being much higher. Now, had the U.S. had to actually invade uh, mainland Japan, that obviously would have been very different. When you put them on the timeline, you see that casualties were the heaviest at the end of the war. The war began on September 1st, 1939. But the U.S. wasn't willing to join the fight until Pearl Harbor, two years in. 
The deaths increased drastically on D-Day, when the Allies invaded Normandy. One of the most tragic moments of the war was on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where 2,500 Americans fell. Yeah, surprisingly, the other beach, uh, there were two American beaches, Omaha. If, you, if you're thinking of it in terms of a left and right flank, Omaha was on the left, and Utah was the very right uh, beach. There were five beaches total. The U.S. had the two furthest to the right, which would, would have been to the west, uh, and Utah was the furthest to the west, um, and they actually suffered significantly fewer casualties, a much, much easier landing there. So about the same number of U.S. soldiers died on this single beach landing as the entire 13 years of the recent war in Afghanistan. The bloodiest battle in the Pacific was Okinawa, yep. which lasted 82 days, during which 12,500 Americans died. And in Okinawa was also where the highest ranking American was killed. That was uh, Lieutenant General Simon B. Buckner Jr. Uh, his father, Simon Buckner Sr., was a Confederate general, a prominent Confederate general during the Civil War. About 5,000 of these deaths were at sea from kamikaze attacks. Mm. Now let's look at some other countries, starting with Europe. Now we're going to see just how small the U.S. numbers were. Germany started World War II when it invaded Poland. Poland ultimately lost 200,000 soldiers in the war. Most died after the invasion while the country was occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany, meanwhile, lost just 16,000 in the invasion of Poland. Wow. The Nazis went on to invade and conquer other countries, including Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Greece, and Yugoslavia. Now, here's something you don't hear a lot about. I mean, at least here in the West, uh, in America, we don't talk a lot about uh, what happened in Yugoslavia. And look at their casualty numbers, their deaths, compared to France. Now, I'm curious to know how many of those were military and how many were civilian. France surrendered, but after losing 92,000 soldiers in the Battle of France, over 200,000 ultimately fell, which includes deaths in POW camps, French colonies, and other fighting. Now, I'm actually surprised by that. I, I expected France would have had more losses than the United States. Uh, I'm honestly surprised the U.S. had doubled the, uh, the deaths. Yugoslavia suffered almost half a million military deaths. The initial invasion brought relatively Post invasion on both sides. But the deaths mounted under Nazi occupation due to guerrilla fighting, civil conflict, and mass executions. Uh, this is going to be nuts. Were swift, with relatively few German losses. Even the Nazi commanders expressed surprise at their success. And then we have the United Kingdom and the United States, who were not invaded but took the fight to the Nazis. Britain lost about the same number of soldiers as the U.S., which includes the British colonies. Now, that I'm also surprised by because, again, I mean, I didn't look at these numbers ahead of time and I've never really taken time to look at uh, at least the other allied numbers. I, I have a little bit of an idea uh, of the losses by Germany and Japan, but I, I'm actually surprised the UK lost that few. Uh, now, granted, that's a much larger percentage of their population than it is of the United States. Germany lost about half a million soldiers fighting the US and Britain in what is known as the Western Front, which took place in France and Belgium. But most Nazi soldiers died in the Eastern Front. Yep. Germany's unsuccessful invasion of the Soviet Union. The numbers are staggering. The most famous battle of the Eastern Front, and perhaps the turning point of mm. the European war, was Stalingrad. The German Sixth Army successfully took Stalingrad, but then got surrounded by the Soviets and cut off from food and ammunition. Half a million Nazis would ultimately die in Stalingrad. Think about that for a minute. As many Germans, and I don't like that he, he said half a million Nazis because that implies that all German soldiers were Nazis and they weren't. Um, I understand that that gets used interchangeably a lot, but I think it's an important distinction to make. Uh, it's like calling all American soldiers Democrats because the Democrats were in control uh, of the government. Um, but uh, as many German soldiers died at Stalingrad as died on the entire Western Front throughout the war. That's incredible to me. And just one more reason why it was so foolish for Hitler to invade 
the Soviet Union when he did in Operation Barbarossa. And I know I'll get a lot of people saying oil, he needed the oil. Well, he never got the oil, and yet he still was able to operate his army until 1945. Imagine how much oil he would have saved by not invading the Soviet Union. He would have, I think, easily been able to hold on. Now, you can argue eventually that Stalin would have invaded Germany anyway. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it certainly was just foolish, and you can see that by the numbers. Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, of which 6,000 would ever return. Hmm. POWs had a low survival rate throughout World War II, and it was particularly grim in the East. Include these POWs. Roughly the same number of Germans died in Stalingrad as all the Western Front fighting against France, the UK, and the US. Yep. Amazing. And though Stalingrad was a victory for the Soviets, they suffered almost twice as many losses as Germany. Oof. The Soviet Union would eventually defeat the once unstoppable German army, killing 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. Think about that. 2.3 million Germans, not Nazis, German soldiers, uh, fighting in the Eastern Front were killed. Uh, only half a million in the Western Front. Wow. But look at the Soviets. Came at a cost. My God. That's got to be 10 million at least. Jeez. More than that. Eight point seven million. Good is the official night. tally by the Russian military. A hotly disputed number. Now, as he said, official tally by the Russian military, and you can probably count on that number then being too low. Some studies have calculated as many as fourteen million. Oh. Look at that. To complete the count of European military deaths, we need to add German deaths from other fronts, including the North and Africa, as well as deaths from other Axis powers allied with the Nazis, Hungary, Romania, and Italy. When you put these European military deaths on the timeline, it looks Ugh. like this. You can now interact with the chart to learn more. Pause the narration if you'd like more time. Wow. And now we switch to civilian deaths in Europe. Six million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. But what people often forget is that it wasn't just Jewish people who were killed during the Holocaust. Uh, a lot of Soviet prisoners of war, uh, a lot of uh, people like the Romani um, gypsies, uh, homosexuals, uh, the infirm, the elderly, a lot of different groups of people. If you separate this by country, you see that about half, 2.7 Poland, were Polish. Yeah. 700,000 were Soviets, followed by Hungary and 17 other countries. Broken down another way, about half of the six million were killed in the concentration camps. Over a million died in Auschwitz. Most were killed in the gas chambers. Others died from starvation, exhaustion, disease, and other forms of execution. The second most deadly camp was Treblinka, which was exclusively an extermination camp, set up to look like a train station. <laughs> Mobile killing groups killed 1.4 million Jews. And that was the mobile killing groups. That's how they kind of did it early on, but it was wasting a lot of ammunition. It wasn't real efficient, took a long time. And that was one of the reasons for the Vonnesee Conference, which is where they met to d discuss the final solution uh, to the Jewish question, as they put it. Uh, and it was at Auschwitz that they uh, really perfected the use of Zyklon B, where they could kill as many as, I think, 10,000 a day uh, at its peak operation. But I think it averaged around 2,000 a day. Which, I mean, you know, I think it was Stalin who said that, um, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And it's really just 
it's appalling to me that I'm even talking about it that way, about 10,000 a day as though that's just a number. But those are 10,000 women, men, children, families. I mean, just I can't even wrap my mind around these numbers. Like with the gas chambers, men were killed first to reduce the risk of revolt. This is a picture that every person should see. And I know there are many more just like it, but but just just look at what's happening here. Look at this. This is a woman holding her child that can't be more than two or three years old. And the guy's got his rifle at the back of her head and he's about to execute the whole family. And, and this, multiply this times hundreds of thousands over and over again. Um, oh. The Holocaust also includes non-Jewish deaths. Between 130,000 to 500,000 Roma, then called gypsies, were killed. The numbers are disputed. About a quarter million people with disabilities were killed. Homosexuals, Catholics, and other groups were also exterminated, but their numbers were relatively small. Some historians say that other civilian deaths should go under the label of Holocaust. About two million non-Jewish Poles were killed under German occupation. Some of it were sent to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Mm. When you combine civilian and military deaths, over 16% of the total Polish population died in World War II. That's like the highest percentage of any country. What is that? One in six? One in six Polish people died during this war. That, my goodness. But not the highest in total death count. The Soviet Union again tops that list, losing at least as many civilians as it did soldiers. Mm. Somewhere between 10 and 20 million. A particularly dark moment of the Soviet Union was the siege of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. German forces surrounded Leningrad before civilians could be evacuated. Supplies, including food, were cut off for two and a half years. One and a half million people died as a result, mm. mostly from starvation, mostly civilians. Stalin's cruelty towards his own people is partly responsible for these numbers. He often didn't allow civilians to evacuate from cities, mm. thinking it would cause the soldiers protecting them to fight harder. About a million Soviets died in Stalin's own labor camps, called the Gulag. You know, it's understandable when you start to look at these numbers. I'm not excusing the way that the Soviet army uh, treated German civilians when they entered Germany, but it makes it much more understandable when you see the devastation that was brought on both civilian and military alike on the Soviet Union by the Germans. Just about every country suffered civilian losses, especially countries who were invaded. While many died as a result of so-called collateral damage, the biggest numbers occurred when it was no accident. Civilians were exterminated, purposely fired upon or bombed, used as human shields, or intentionally deprived of food. The intentional killing of civilians was done by most warring parties, including the United Kingdom and the United States. The United Kingdom was spared of a land invasion, but still lost 60,000 civilians, largely from German air raids or blitzes, often directed at civilian population centers. The UK did the same to German cities at a much greater magnitude. True. Causing about 10 times the number of deaths. You know, people talk like to talk a lot about the um, US bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we killed far more uh, in firebombing of cities like Tokyo, Dresden, and Germany. Uh, just devastating numbers of civilians that were killed in these bombings. But most German civilian deaths came from the ground at the late stage of the war. When the Nazi regime collapsed, civilians living in occupied regions hmm. had to desperately flee from the advancing Soviet army. Yeah, and it's not just that, but places like uh, Czechoslovakia, for example. Uh, ethnic Germans, people who were German who had moved to Czechoslovakia, were often lined up and shot very much like uh, other people groups had been lined up and shot by the, by the Germans uh, before the war or in the early parts of the war. The same thing started happening to Germans that they had done to other, other groups of people. 
rapes were widespread, mm. and death estimates ranged from 600,000 to 3 million. Let's step back and see where we are with the totals. <laughs> we just counted about 20 million civilian deaths in Europe. That's we just Europe. This to the European military deaths we already covered. It brings us to over 40 million. Then we have the Asian theater. Mm. Here we see the vast majority of military deaths in Asia came from China and Japan. Yep. On the civilian side, about 6 million deaths from China, Indonesia, Korea, Indochina, and the Philippines can be attributed to Japanese war crimes, mm -hmm. which are sometimes compared to the Nazi atrocities due to the sheer scale of the cruelty. Yeah, and look at that. I mean, 6 million. That's the number of Jews killed during the Holocaust. Now, granted, there were far more civilians killed than just in the Holocaust, but uh, this should not be forgotten. China had the second highest death count after the Soviet Union. And like the Soviets, the Chinese government demonstrated a stunning willingness to sacrifice its own people. Yep. Chinese nationalists opened the dike at the Yellow River, hoping the flood would halt the Japanese advance. Half a million Chinese civilians or more were killed, which is two or three times the number who died in all countries in the 2004 Asian tsunamis. But the invasion of China only cost Japan 200,000 soldiers. Mm. Most were killed fighting the U.S. and allies in the Pacific War. A significant portion of Japanese civilian deaths were caused by American firebombing and the two nuclear attacks. Yeah. Contrary to official U.S. statements, these airstrikes were directed at civilian populations, not military targets. When you add all the deaths outside of Europe, it brings us to a grand total of 70 million for the war, mm. give or take depending on who's counting and what civilian deaths get included. So that obviously makes it the deadliest war in human history. But I think, and if he he mentioned at the beginning, he's going to talk about some other wars. I think you'd be surprised at some of the other wars, primarily in China. Uh, I think China had at least four different wars, uh, just like civil wars, internal wars uh, that took at least 20 million lives. I think there was one back all the way in the 8th century that may, may have taken as many as 36 million lives. Uh, but I don't know how much he'll get into that. More people died in World War II than in any other war in history. For comparison, here are 20 or so of the very worst wars and atrocities we have on record. Some of these are more of atrocities than wars, but we've seen how that distinction can get blurry. Some of these spanned across centuries. World War II had the highest body count, and it all happened in just six years. Mm -hmm. The world's population has grown significantly since the earliest atrocities on this list. If you want to compare them in terms of what percentage of the world... There you go. We can adjust the chart to look like this. Yep. This rough approximation tells us there may have been more devastating wars before World War II, proportionally speaking. Yep. When we turn to post-war conflicts, it's hard to say anything that isn't controversial. Mm. But the data shows something quite extraordinary has been happening. In 1989, John Gaddis coined the phrase, the long peace, to identify the absence of conflict between the nuclear powers during the Cold War. Uh, this is not entirely true, though. While we didn't officially go to war, you know, but for example, between the US and the Soviet Union, uh, you very much have proxy wars happening in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, places like this where, um, you know, we're at war in all but name. It's part of the Cold War, so to speak. And there were millions who died in some of those conflicts. 25 years later, the Cold War is over, and the term is still being used, although its meaning may have shifted. European countries have not fought each other, except for this 10-day war in 1956, when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary. When we look at European wars before World War II, it looks like this. Mm. They tend to be more frequent as you go back, though smaller in scale. And the largest 44 economies of the world have not battled each other since World War II. Rich countries have fought poorer countries, like the US versus Iraq. Mm -hmm. But rich countries have not fought other rich countries, 
Such a period of peace between the so-called great powers hasn't been seen since the Roman Empire. Okay, that's fair. Peace is too strong of a word. Wars have occurred since World War II, and they can be grouped into these four categories. We don't see colonial wars anymore. We've already noted that interstate wars between rich countries have not occurred at all, and here we see wars involving smaller economies have tapered off. That leaves civil wars of two types, with and without foreign intervention. And this is what these battle deaths look like alongside of World War II. More people died mm. fighting in World War II than in all the wars since. And again, we can't forget about world population, which has almost tripled since World War II. If we scale these numbers to show deaths in proportion to world population, showing the likelihood that a person on Earth dies in battle, the downward trend becomes even more pronounced. Now, this isn't to infer anything about why this trend is occurring. That's a discussion for another day. You can now. It does make you wonder if there was another big war, if it would just be absolutely devastating compared to the others. I don't know. Um, you know, we've got much more accurate weapons now, uh, much more deadly weapons now. I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, let me know what you think about the possibility of future war. Interact with this chart to explore what conflicts are behind the totals. Now, bear in mind, we're just looking at battle deaths here, not civilian deaths. But those two are in decline. Is a difficult thing to measure. It's a bit like counting the people who didn't die in wars that never happened. Hmm. We give such importance to the word peace, but we don't tend to notice it when it occurs or report on it. Sometimes it takes reminding ourselves of how terrible war once was to see the peace that has been growing around us. Yeah. Of course, this trend may not continue, and it's not clear how looking at these charts can help us make the right decisions to ensure that it does. But the longer the long peace grows, the more significant it becomes. Hmm. So if watching the news doesn't make us feel hopeful about where things are heading, watching the numbers might. Well, that was really well done. Um, so Neil Halloran's the guy who did that video. I'd highly recommend that you go over and support his channel. Uh, watch it on the original. Uh, hit the like button. Give him th that support that he deserves. Uh, let me know your thoughts about all of that. Use the comment section below. And again, please hit that like button. And uh, continue to subscribe for daily content. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.